Hey everybody, welcome back to our Light Bearers Bible study. We are really excited to have you here. And if any of you are new, my name is Allie, and I just want to give you all a really big welcome. And thanks for joining us every week. This has been a super fun study. In case you don't know, we've been studying through the three angels messages of Revelation 14. And today we are talking about the wine of God's wrath. So I'm excited and I think Ty is excited and Angelo. Um, yeah, again, welcome everybody. We've got Annette from Costa Rica, we've got Renee. Um, this is gonna be super fun. Terry, hey, it's good to see you here. Um, I'm gonna bring Ty and Angelo up. And for those of you who don't know, um, let's see here, we've got, there we go. Uh, we've got Ty here. And then if, um, if any of you don't That's know, Angela. we've got Angelo. Angelo's been here with us once before, I think or twice, something like that, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, if, you're, if you don't know Angelo, he's our friend. He's also a pastor in Florida and we are happy to have him here. So right. guys, how's it going? Pretty good, how are you? Doing good. Doing pretty well. Um, let's get you started. You can hear me, Ellie? I can hear you great. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay, good. all right. Yeah, yeah, where are, you, yeah. where are you at? Are you, uh, I'm trying to make out where you're at, are you? Oh, I'm at the oh, office, you're in, I just you're... rearranged. Oh, did you rearrange? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I moved the couch and I actually well, cleaned it's good to for see once. you. <laughs> it's good to see you guys too. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> let's get started. Ty, do you want to pray? And yeah, and I'll just let yeah, you guys yeah. come at it. We'll do that. Father in heaven, this is a challenging subject. Uh, it is about you. We're going to be exploring the divine passions, the activity the movement inside of you, inside of the emotions of God and connected with that, your actions, Lord, how, how is it that you feel, Lord, when you witness abuse and oppression and evil? How do you feel, dear Lord, in your heart as you look down upon our, our world and the kinds of things that we do to one another? Father, how, how are you doing with us? God, I ask that you would bring a sense of, of reverence over our hearts right now as we open your word so that we can understand you, so that we can know you um, as you are. May your word be a light to our minds and to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And I forgot to mention, just in case anybody is new, there's always a Q&A time at the end. So if you have questions, like I said, this is a challenging topic. So as they're going through the study, if it generates questions in your mind, feel free to click the Ask a Question tab at the bottom center of your screen at the end. We will hopefully tackle them. All right, guys. Have fun. All right. Thank you, Allie. Thanks. All right, everybody. Um, this is a challenging subject. I'm going to give the briefest of introductions to where we've come from and what our series is so we can give as much time as possible to tackle this extremely challenging subject. Our topic is the Three Angels Messages in a series of studies each Wednesday night. And so we've been moving through the three messages that are brought to you in Revelation chapter 14, uh, phrase by phrase, verse by verse, first angel's message, second angel's message, third angel's message. Now, all of those studies are logged on our uh, website as well as the Lightbearers Facebook page. So you can go to lightbearers.org, lightbearers.org, or to the Light Lightbearers Facebook page and you can look, you can watch and view and take notes and study the subject. I'm not going to give any recap of what we've covered so far so as to give us the most time possible. We have now come to the third angel's message. And in the third angel's message, we have this curious thought provoking phrase, the wine of the wrath of God. Let's just shorten this to the wrath of God. Our topic tonight 
is the wrath of God. Now it sounds it sounds ominous, but we're Bible students. You're Bible students. Angelo's a Bible student. I'm a Bible student. So we don't want to sweep any part of Scripture under any rug. We want to look at the whole of. If we encounter in Scripture some uncomfortable phrase, term, idea, uh, we want to face it and, and we want to try to understand it. We want to process it. OK, now this particular topic is one that has the potential um, to evoke in us not only a lot of thinking, but a lot of feeling. And here's why. For example, I'll just I'll just trigger us right now at the point. Uh, the Bible says God is our father. So just let the word father rest upon your mind for a moment. The Bible also says that God, our father, experiences something the Bible calls wrath or anger. So let your mind rest upon the word wrath or anger for a minute. And for some of you, including me, the juxtaposition of the word father and anger is a lot to process. It's a lot to process. Am I correct? Chime in right there in, in the chat. Let me know. Are you, do you have a past like mine? I mean, you know, my memories of the juxtaposition of those two words. I mean, I was raised by a, a quote unquote father who made me stand in the backyard against the, the, fence balancing a beer can on my head while he sat there with his friends pointing a scope rifle at me and meaning to blow my head off if I drop the can of beer off of my head. Wow. There was anger. There was wrath. And that was daddy. That was father. So I want to begin by simply saying this is not a, a simple subject to tackle. This isn't a trite subject. This isn't something that we can just kind of shrug our shoulders about and say, oh yeah, the wrath of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let us close with... No. This is... We're talking about something pretty serious here, the wrath of God. Now, Angelo, if you wouldn't mind, and everybody else that, that's tuned in, I would like to access this subject through a door a mental door that I'm going to call a thought experiment. Okay. And everybody, you're going to have to track really carefully. So shut out everything around you and tune in because I'm going to ask you to engage with me in a thought experiment in order to open this subject up to us. Are you ready? Are you ready, you guys? Okay. Here's the thought experiment. I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine that you're in your house, just doing your normal stuff in your house. You hear a knock on the door. You, or you open it, and there you find a police officer. The police officer who has just knocked on your door looks like he has a very somber look on his face. Officer, may I help you? And the officer says to you, well, I have some really bad news. Your son was just brutally murdered. Now I want you, this is going to be a challenging thought experiment. Okay. You're standing at the door. The police officer just told you your son has been brutally murdered. I want you to feel those feelings for a minute. What are those feelings? What do you feel? You've heard that your son has been murdered. Now the word murder implies a, a murderer. Somebody has murdered your son. Somebody has done this. You're standing there at the door and you have all kinds of emotions inside you. What kind of emotion? What do you feel? Are you, are you angry? Let me ask this. Should you be angry? Should you be? Do you yeah. have wrath? Should you have wrath? Somebody has murdered your son. What do you feel? Do you feel nonchalant? 
Do you feel like, oh yeah, thanks for the news. I got to get back to watching my television show. No, what do you feel? You feel anger and your anger is exactly what you should feel. If you're psychologically well-adjusted, you should be angry that somebody just murdered your son. Now, let me take the thought experiment a step further. Do you want the police officers to apprehend, to capture the person who murdered your son? Well, yes, of course you do. Do you want them to arrest the person, slap handcuffs on them, take them to jail? Yes, you do. Do you want that person to stand trial for the murder of your son? Yes, you do. Okay, but now the thought experiment is going to go absolutely crazy in a direction that nobody sees coming. Feel all those feelings of legitimate anger for a moment. And then the police officer who just said, your son has been brutally murdered. And just as you're feeling all those feelings, feelings of, oh, who did this? Catch them, slap the handcuffs on them, put them in jail, take them to trial, full extent of the law, punish them. Do you feel it? Of course you do. And just as you're feeling all that wrath, just as you're feeling all that, the police officer says, well, actually, the news is worse than that. Because the person who murdered your son is your daughter. And I'm deliberately leaving you alone right now. Just for a few seconds. Now, what do you feel? Have your feelings changed at all? Have they changed? Well, let me ask you a series of questions. Are you still angry? Yes. You're still angry. Do you still want the person who murdered your son, your daughter, to be caught, apprehended? Yeah, yes, you do. Do you still want the person who murdered your son to stand trial? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, you're thinking, well, yeah, okay. Um, well, can I talk to her first? Can I talk to my daughter? Please, can I talk to my... Do you see what's happening here? Yeah, I want her to stand trial. Can I talk to her? What's happened with your anger? You just felt two kinds of emotions. You felt the emotions of an anger against a no name somebody who murdered someone you love. And then you realized that the person who murdered your son is also someone you love. So now, your anger has undergone an alteration. Your anger is not gone, but your anger has under, undergone an alteration. What kind of, now your anger is flooded with love and mercy and pain. And can I talk to her? Why did you do this? Sweetie, what? Your brother, what? Do you see what's happening here? Okay, I'm going to suggest to you, I'm going to suggest to all of us that God's wrath is more like the second set of emotions rather than the first set of emotions, right? Is anybody tracking with me? Angelo, are you, what, Angelo, what do you, Bro, are you tracking? Do you get it? Do you, of course you do. Do you see it? So when we speak of the wrath of God, for God, listen, I hope you guys are tracking with this. I'm going to say, I'm just going to say it. For God, 
every victim and every victimizer is God's child. There is no no name, random, psycho, murderer, freak without a name for God. There, there is no person, there is no person that's that's one step out from the full reality of God's love fastened upon that individual. God's emotions are less like the first set of emotions and much more like the second set of emotions. But I want you to hear something now. We as human beings in our broken, fallen, dysfunctional, messed up condition, our anger and wrath is most of the time like the first set of emotions. And then we tend to transpose that anger over the character of God and assume that God is angry in the way we're angry, failing to realize that for God, both the murderer and the murdered, both the thief and the thieved, both both and both are God's children. So so right there in that simple mental exercise we have a window into how it is cuz here's the big conundrum. Here's the big mystery of divine passion. How can a god of love simultaneously be a god of wrath and anger? Well, how can can a mother or a father love their son and daughter and at the same time be angry because of what that son or daughter has done? Okay, so Angela, what do you think? Oh, man. I mean, I'm not thinking right now because, Ty, you are a master at getting me in my feels and I'm all up in my feelings right now. And (laughs) it's making it hard to think rationally because, you know, obviously I have a son and a daughter and, um, and I'm feeling that turning in my stomach. I'm feeling just that fluttering um, of emotions, Mm. uh, just trying to put myself through that, that thought experiment, which is, which is really a, an emotion experiment. Um, and I think something that you said that, I mean, it was a question that I asked when you were talking about our how we would feel. And then I wrote, does God feel in the same way that we feel? And, and so I know that because we are created in the image of God, everything that we experience in the physical and in the emotional and the relational realm are a microcosm mm-hmm. or a mirror of the divine. And, and it causes me to ask this question when I think about the wrath of God and the anger of God, even that second kind, is that how has sin, um, how has sin worked itself through generations and now even in my own body, so much so that where I may get confused when I try to compare my emotions to God's emotions, because what if I am projecting my, even my righteous anger, what if I'm projecting the way I experience it onto God and how do I keep myself from, from making assumptions about God's wrath and about God's emotions and about God's feelings um, that are maybe based on what I feel, but that are not the complete picture of how God feels. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, totally. Totally. I had a guy say to me one time, um, see, see, see if anybody else has ever experienced this kind of discussion. I had a guy say to me one time, I could never love a God of wrath. Mm. And my immediate response was, I could never love a God 
incapable of wrath. Mm. You see that? I mean, he's saying, mm. I can never worship a God who gets angry. I said, well, I could never worship a God who doesn't get angry. He said, well, what mm -hmm. do you mean? I, I said, okay. So if I see a grown man, a grown man punch a little girl in the head, mm. should I be angry? And mm -hmm. he said, well, uh, I, I, well, I said, okay, if I'm not angry, if I can watch a grown man punch a little girl and not feel anything, what's, mm -hmm. what, that's called something in, in the literature, in the scientific, mm -hmm. in the medical literature. What's, that's, called, that's called psychopathy. If, mm -hmm. if I can watch <laughs> a grown man brutalize a little girl and not get angry, something is wrong with me. Mm -hmm. How could God look down upon this world and see the kinds of things that go on in our world and not be angry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, I, so, so, so Angelo is, is anger and wrath necessarily incompatible with love? No. <laughs> so I want to share with you something because I've been struggling with, with this and it's like you said, Ty, every, whenever we study this subject, um, it's always going to bring out in us our own experiences and our own emotional makeup, right? And the way we feel comfortable interpreting mm -hmm. it and in the ways that we don't. Mm -hmm. And so I had to get on Twitter and ask some friends and I'll share some things that were shared. But I was looking up that the word anger as it's used in the okay. book of Revelation and the Greek word there is orge. And it's used about 36 times in the New Testament. Um, it's used about five times, I believe, in the Gospels, um, and it's only used once when it's describing Jesus being orge, which is the word there for anger, and it's in Mark chapter 3, verse 4 to 5, and so I'm just going to read that because it kind of helped me right. a little bit to, to understand the nature of Christ's okay. anger, and in Ma Mark right. chapter 3, verse 4, to five, 4 through 5, we see that Jesus is healing a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, right? So a man with the withered hand comes to Jesus and it's the Sabbath. He's already been picking, you know, the germs, the, the wheat germ with his disciples. So the, the religious leaders are already um, throwing shade on him. And, and then he mm. comes to this man and he sees the man with the withered hand. And this is what it says. It says, and Jesus said to him, to them, the scribes and the Pharisees who were looking at Jesus, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? to save life or to kill, but mm. they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger. That's the Greek word, the, the only time it's used um, describing Jesus. He looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. And I think it's just so amazing that, first of all, the anger of Jesus is directed towards not necessarily the religious leaders, but towards their hardness of heart. He was angry yeah. about the fact that they had to stop and mm. think about, wait, is it right to do good on the Sabbath? Like, like they didn't have an answer right away. Why? Because their right. heart had become so hard and they had become so in um, incapable of showing any kind of compassion or sympathy for the people around them because mm, they mm, were so mm. caught up with the letter of the law, particularly referring to the yeah. Sabbath. And so here their silence makes Jesus angry. Yes. Their silence in the face of brokenness, their silence in the face of woundedness, mm. their mm. silence in the face of the fact that their fellow human being is suffering and, the, and when Jesus says, is it okay to fix this guy? And they're like, um, wait, what? And as soon as they, they hesitate, Jesus is angry. And it says that he's grieved at their hardness of heart. And what does he do? How, does, how is his anger? How is his, <laughs> like, it's so funny because you think of that someone gets angry and they would do something destructive. But Jesus is angry and he does something restorative. And I think that this mm. for me, it, it gave me kind of uh, an yeah. insight into God's wrath is God's wrath is 
destructive towards the things that destroy us. So that means yeah. that God's wrath is ultimately restorative and that God's mm -hmm. anger is stirred up when the people who he loves are being ignored. Their yeah. suffering and their yeah. pain are being ignored. Yes. And so that perspective yes. can help me when I go to the book of Revelation to say, okay, yeah. I can't just look at this wrath of God thing and think about the Sabbath. Because if I'm mm -hmm. looking at the three angels message and I look at the wrath of God and the only thing I think about is, okay, that's for the people who aren't keeping the Sabbath right, then I'm probably in the same line as these Pharisees and priests when there's people all around me who are suffering and, I, yeah. and, my, and my indignation, my orge and, my, and I'm not grieved at the fact that there are people around me right now who are God's children who are suffering. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, so, so, so the Bible explicitly says in the passage you just read in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus was angry. He was angry and he was grieved. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and then throughout the scriptures, the word wrath and anger is used repeatedly, not a few times, but repeatedly to describe the, the psychological, emotional state of being that God is experiencing. God is experiencing anger. God is experiencing wrath. And so when that guy said to me, I could never love a God of anger. And I said, well, I could never love a God who wouldn't mm -hmm. experience anger. Mm -hmm. You know, one time my, my daughter said to me, you know, something was done to her. She was mistreated and she told me about it. And I expressed anger about what she experienced. Yeah. There was just like this burst of like, oh, I can't believe they did that to you, Leah. Yeah. You know, I was angry about it. And then I, I said, Leah, I'm so sorry for that, that outburst of, of passion mm. about the wrong that was done to you. And she yeah. said, she said, Daddy, don't, don't be sorry. She said, she said, I would feel worse if you didn't feel that way about yeah. what was done to me. Do, yeah. do you see that, Angelo? Yeah. So, so my little girl, my little girl is hurt by somebody, and I don't feel anger. Yeah. Th yeah. There's something fundamentally wrong. Yeah. I'm not psychologically well adjusted. Something's wrong with me if I can witness the harming and the hurting of people I love, and even people I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if yeah. I just witness a horrific act done by one human being against another human being, um. The right way to feel is angry, yeah. right? Now, back to our opening illustration, however. The opening illustration or thought experiment, or like you said, emotional experiment, is extremely important for me because it helps me to understand that, that the way I feel about a wrong done against someone I love right? Mm -hmm. Changes when I realize that the one who committed the wrong against the one I love is also someone I love. I love. If, my, mm -hmm. if my daughter wrongs my son, if my son wrongs my daughter, my anger is then flooded with love. My anger is flooded with mercy. So now I have this, this tension that's taking place inside of me. So I can't experience, if I love two people and one is a victim and one is a victimizer, right? Mm -hmm. I can't experience full throttle, 100% justice. I have to experience justice that is equalized by mercy. I just, I, my, my, justice is flooded with mercy my mercy is flooded with justice mercy in if you draw a circle and on that circle you write the words god is love within the parameters of that circle you can write justice and mercy there is no dichotomy between you you, you it's not a correct theological formulation to say god is love but don't forget god is also just mm -hmm. No, God is not love and also just. God is love, therefore God is just. Mm -hmm. Justice, anger, wrath, 
is a righteous and legitimate dimension of the love of God. And mm -hmm. it's not contrary to the love of God, right? If yeah. you're a father, you know that. If you're a mother, you so, know that. If you're a husband, you know that. If you're a wife, you know that. So help, help me... Help me understand how someone who is a victim takes that journey in the se in the way that they are relating to the person who is their victimizer, who wasn't, who who has abused them, who has victimized them, and how do how do we? I don't know. How does that person take that journey where they see this person who has taken so much from them and yeah. they, their only comfort is in knowing that God is going to mete out justice because they can't do it themselves. And I can imagine that if, if that had happened, something had terrible had happened to me at the hands of someone else that I would, mm -hmm. it would be hard for me to look at that person and say, I must relate to them as you know my brother because that's how Jesus relates to them. Um, how do I take that journey of wanting to feel justified in my, in my righteous anger towards that person and wanting to see them meet justice while at the same time being true to the character of God in the way that you just described it? That, that seems to me like, a, I don't know, like yeah. a hard journey to take, you know? It's a hard journey to take. Um, you know, in pastoral work, part of what we do is counseling. So we're constantly working through with people the very issue that you just articulated. Mm -hmm. um, and it's vitally important that, that a victim, a person who has experienced horrific evil committed against them, that their pain and their anger not be minimized or dismissed. Mm. It, it, it's, 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 it's wrong. You know, I was, with, I was with a person recently who had undergone horrific abuse mm. at the hands of her father. Mm. And I listened to her story and the first thing I said it wasn't calculated. It was what I felt. It was, it was what I felt in the moment. She just told me what was done to her. And the first thing that came out of my mouth is I said, I said, wow. I said, mm. oh, I am so, so angry mm. at your father for doing that to you. And she, she kind of, she was taken aback by it. She, she said, you are? And I, I said, yes. Hmm. She said, and then you're not going to believe this. She said to me, so, so it's not wrong for me to feel hmm. that way? Hmm. And I said, not only is it not wrong for you to feel that way, that is precisely the normal right way to feel. You, hmm. How can you feel otherwise? He did horrible things to you. And... Re a religion that comes along that says, oh, you shouldn't feel that way. You should mm -hmm. just forgive him. And by forgive, it means be completely resolved mm -hmm. in your emotional state toward him. Mm -hmm. No, that's not forgiveness. So I walk people through an understanding of forgiveness that I think is extremely helpful where I say, okay, your father, your uncle, your brother, whoever, somebody abused you. Somebody did horrific, horrible things to you. And I... I have people come to me sometimes, oftentimes over the years and say, oh, I'm a Christian and I know I should forgive him, but I can't. Mm -hmm. And I always say this. I say, do you, do you hate what he did to you? To which the answer is always yes. I hate what he did to me. Do you wish that he would see how bad that that was the thing that he did to you, how evil it was. Do you wish that he would see that horrible thing for what it is and deeply repent for it so that he would never do it ever again to anybody else? And inevitably she will say yes. Hmm. 
And I say, and do you wish that he would so clearly see what he did to you for what it is and so deeply repent that he would never do it to anybody else? So much so that he would become a different kind of person incapable of doing that. So different, in fact, that that person who did that to you would spend all of eternity in the presence of God as a totally different kind of creature incapable of such horrific things. And inevitably, she will say, yes, yes, I hate what he did to me. Yes, I wish he would see it for what it really is. Yes, I wish he would repent of it so deeply that he would never do it again to anybody else. And yes, I wish that he would become such a different kind of person that he would spend eternity in the presence of God as a totally different kind of person. And I always say to her, these many hers over the years, mm. then you have forgiven him. Mm. And inevitably she will say, what do you mean I've forgiven him? him because I still feel anger. And I say, your anger is legitimate, but you have forgiven him because your forgiveness is manifest in you want what is ultimately best for him, which is to see what he did and never do it again and be incapable of ever doing it again by the transforming grace of God. And she says, well, well, my dad, my uncle, my brother, whoever did this to me, he says, if I really forgive him, that I will let him back into my life. Mm. And I always say, no. Now, this is really crucial, you guys. And Angelo, you'll resonate with this, Angelo. Forgiveness is not synonymous with trust. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is not synonymous with fondness. You can forgive someone and not trust them simultaneously. Mm. Those, those are not in, con you can for I can say, I forgive you, but I don't trust you. Mm -hmm. You're not babysitting my children. I don't care if you're their grandfather. You'll never come near them again. Yeah. I forgive you, but I don't trust you. I, for mm -hmm. I forgive you, but I don't, don't like you. Does that sound mm -hmm. horrible? Does that sound like something's wrong? No, I forgive you, but I don't like you. Mm -hmm. I don't like the person that you are. I forgive you, and I don't want to have Tuesday night spaghetti dinners with you. Mm -hmm. I forgive you, and you are blocked from having access to me and my children. Mm -hmm. So, so it's an extremely important to understand this because people think that forgiveness is synonymous with warm, fond, friendly feelings that allows the, the, the victimizer back in to have access to my life. No, it does not. Forgiveness is not synonymous with trust or fondness. Yeah. Cause sometimes you can forgive that someone and never speak to them again. And, and I think when you're describing this idea of, is it your desire that this person comes to a place of complete repentance where they never do that thing again, yeah. where they recognize the, the evil in it, that it takes justice to get people sometimes, yes. well, it always takes justice to get someone to that place. And when yes. we say, oh, I'm gonna forgive you and we'll let you back in, we're just enabling that whatever that thing is, that keeps them from experiencing justice. We are in, in, in many ways, we're yes. suspending the justice that is necessary in order for them to come to a full repentance. That's and, right. and often it's because we feel like the consequences might be too grave, you know, that we don't want that person's life to be ruined. But I think sometimes we, we take this life and we, we put too much value on it because if my life here has to get ruined in order for me to come to a place where I fully repent and accept Christ, then it's worth right. it. Um, yeah. And I think that this is where people who try to help victimizers towards that path get demonized because they recognize that it's not going to come just by shoving it under the rug, the things that you did. Um, and that, that's hard. That's, right. that, that's a hard journey to take when you love someone. You don't want to see them exposed. You don't want to see them, you know, necessarily go through all these crazy things, even if they've hurt you. This is kind of the, the yeah. challenging part of being entangled with somebody is you are hurt by them. But at the same time, you may still want something. You may still not want to see them suffer yeah. to that degree. Um, there's a couple yeah. uh, comments here that I just want to read that were really good. Um, okay. If you don't mind. So. No, I, don't mind. I think 
Renee said it's critically important, and you and you mentioned this, never to push a victim to forgive or quote unquote love or to be involved with their abuser, which you brought out. And then Nicole says, yes, victims of abuse often don't know how to balance anger. Sometimes we are swallowed by rage. Sometimes we're unable to feel angry at all. We don't want to become like our abusers. One of the best things a healer can do is express and model anger at the evil while showing that right. God's anger is loving. And I think that, that that's, exactly. Really, exactly. that's really great, this idea of modeling. Because here's what I think is God, when I think about the emotional makeup of God, often this is how I think we're very different in that often my emotions um, the spikes or the valleys are connected to experiences that I experience in real time. So when that police officer knocks on my door and I come to the realization right. of what has happened, I am now caught up in this cascade of emotions because I did not know it was going to happen. And I don't know what's going to happen afterwards. So the emotions that I'm mm -hmm. feeling are very visceral and they're very connected to time and space. But what's interesting is that yeah. God doesn't experience time and space the way we do, right? Because he transcends time and space. So nothing that happens to us is really ever a surprise to him. He sees the whole panorama of history all at once. And so that then, mm -hmm. that then for me, it, it gives me this sense of, okay, so then if he doesn't experience the acuteness of my of emotions the way that I do, because he sees it all from the end to the beginning, why is there text in scripture where Jesus weeps, even though he knows he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead or, mm -hmm. or anger, mm -hmm. Jesus's cup is full. What I'd like to think is that what God is doing is he's, what Nicole said, he's modeling for us. He's helping us to see that what we feel, he feels it too. And it's okay to feel that way because what's happening to us, what's happening around us in this sin-filled world is not the way things are supposed to be. It's not natural. Yeah. And so when yeah. the Bible describes the emotions of God, um, Kessia, who's someone I was interacting with on Twitter, she said it this way. She says that, you know, it's hard to understand the feelings of God, but she would like to uh, uh, imagine that God doesn't get carried away with feelings. But instead, the way that he expresses his feelings in scripture are, are, are real, but they're also to help us to give us permission to also feel those things as well and to model for us the mm -hmm. right way in which yes. to feel yes. those feelings. Um, so, yeah. So that, that, Angelo, is a good transition into how God's wrath is expressed, how, it's, how, it, how it is acted at out how it is how it is is unfolded so so what we've talked about so far is god's god's emotional state you know and we gave the illustration the opening illustration you're standing at the door the police officer tells you your son has been brutally murdered you feel anger because somebody murdered your son but mm -hmm. the person who murdered your son at that point is a nameless you know, criminal who did this to your son and you're full of rage and you want the full extent of punishment and et cetera, et cetera, because you don't know who it is. But the moment the police officer says, but the person who murdered your son is your daughter. Mm -hmm. Now your, your just, your sense of justice and rage and anger, which are all legitimate are flooded with mercy and compassion and pain and a desire to understand. Right? So mm -hmm. now you're in a different emotional state because you love both the victim and the victimizer. So see, mm -hmm. God's situation is like the second set of emotions again. Mm -hmm. There is no person who is two steps out from God's mm -hmm. full love. That's crazy. There is no no-name freak for God. There is no there is no random alias person for God who committed a murder. Every mm -hmm. single person who does wrong is in the first person intimacy with God as father. Wow. Everyone who is doing, everyone who is experiencing the evil is in God's intimate inner circle of love. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once we realize this, once we realize this, we can begin to wrap our minds around what the Bible is talking about when it explains to us how God now 
Ali is back, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna turn to all of these scriptures, but I'm going to rattle them. Uh, Angela, I want you to interact with them if you could, okay? Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm going to rattle through a series of scriptures, the punchline of which is just mind blowing. If you follow Paul's reasoning, I'm not making this up. This is this is the 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 text of scripture within Paul's reasoning process, okay? So in the book of Romans, okay, take these notes down of all these texts. In the book of Romans, chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. So there's our term for our study tonight. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. Right there, we're saying, okay, we've, we've gone through that tonight. We've realized that God legitimately is angry, that, that God has legitimate wrath. The wrath of God is revealed. Now watch this. That word, that word wrath is the word that you referred to a moment ago. It's orge. It is the word that describes the emotional condition of a, a flood of turbulent emotions, right? It's like you're standing at the door and you were just told that the person that, that you're your son was murdered. You feel those feelings? Well, God feels them on a completely epic scale compared to how we feel them. Okay? So then, watch this. That's verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And then this. In verse 24, it says, therefore God gave them up mm -hmm. to their sins. The word there in the Greek is paradiodomini, okay? That's a mouthful. Same so twice. that's the Greek word. God gave them up. That's verse 24. Watch this. 26, again, same Greek word. God gave them up. Verse 28, again, God gave them over. Same Greek word. Mm -hmm. Verse 27, it is called the penalty which they deserve. Mm -hmm. The wrath of God is the penalty which they deserve three times is defined by a Greek word that is gave them up, gave them up, gave them over. Verse 32 calls this the righteous judgment of God. Mm -hmm. What is the righteous judgment of God? The yeah. righteous judgment of God is the penalty they deserve, mm -hmm. the penalty they deserve, and it is the wrath of God, and it is the act of God in giving them up, giving them over, to what their sins entail. Now, here's the punchline. A lot of people are familiar with, with those verses defining the wrath of God as gave them up, gave them up, gave them up, gave them up. But then God uses the same, I mean, Paul uses the same Greek word only two other times. Romans chapter 4, verses 24 and 25 and then Romans chapter 8, verse 32, Paul says that God, same Greek word, gave up his son mm. to the cross, to death, to the penalty, to the wrath. So the pattern of the book of Roman is tracking for us how the orge of God, the, the turbulent, emotional passions of God's legitimate anger, the judgment of God, the wrath of God, how does it pan out in the final outcomes of this world? It pans out by God, the parent at the door. You remember in the illustration, we asked the question, do you want your daughter to be apprehended by the police, yes. Do you want her to be arrested? Yes. Do you want her to be taken to court? Are you going to testify and press charges? Do you want her to be incarcerated? Yes, yes, yes. What are you doing? Your heart is still full of anger for what she did to your son, but she's your daughter, and you are giving her over to the outworking of the process of the judgment of deeds. And so the wrath of God in this kind of fashion, we should not imagine 
that the wrath of God, like Kessia, in the tweets that you were just reading to us, Kessia is getting at this point when she says, we should not interpret the wrath of God as God basically losing emotional control and throwing punches. Mm -hmm. We should not, okay, if you're standing or and the police officer says your son has been murdered and the guy, the no name psycho who killed your son is right out here on the front lawn, you're running out of the door, grabbing that guy, pulling his hair and punching him in the head. Mm -hmm. If the police officer says your son was murdered and your daughter did it and she's out on the lawn, you're going to run out there, throw your arms around her, mm. weeping out the hot tears of your anger, saying, mm. why, baby girl, why did you do this? Mm. Why? You want to understand. And you are simultaneously forgiving her as you are walking her to the police car to be apprehended and to undergo. Do you see what I'm saying? It's it's a completely different set of emotions. And God is in that second set of emotions on a kind of zenith level compared mm -hmm. to us in our function mm -hmm. as human beings. Hi, Ali. Oh, hi, Ali. <laughs> You go ahead, Angela. <laughs> something you wanted to say. Uh, I think that's important because in the book of Revelation, there's always this juxtaposition between the beastly uh, metaphors and the lamb's metaphors. So you have Christ and Antichrist. Mm -hmm. You have the mark of the beast and the seal of God. And even here in, in, in Revelation 14, Babylon has the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and then God has the wine of the wrath of God. And so we always see that yeah. there is a beastly system and a human way to respond and to mete out ju judgment and wrath, and then there's God's way. And, and I think the book of Revelation is clear that we have to choose our beast. Are we going to choose the beast, the 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 you know the beast of the dragon, or are we going to choose the Lamb of God? And when we choose our beast, then the way that he relates to us and the way that we relate to him, it's diametrically opposed and completely opposite. So mm. if we want to understand a little bit about how God meets out his wrath, just look at what the devil does and know that it's not going to look like that at all. That's right. That's right. I think a good sermon title. That's actually from. You don't um, use it. I'll use it. That's a no, song. Your sermon title. You either <laughs> choose. You, no, no, no. That's not that. The sermon title, and you can use it or I'll use it. Is choose your beast. Yeah, that's a song by Jennifer Schwerzer and Lee G. I gotta give them a shout out. They they did oh, a. Is that, is that the name of the record. song? Choose your yeah. beast. Yeah, they did a record called "The <laughs> Lamb Wins." And it's a it's a it's on the book of Revelation and they have a song called Choose Your Beast. It's it's fire. So <laughs> I didn't know that. You I need to check that. it out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So hey, I will say this. You said if you want to know what the wrath of God doesn't look like, look at how the beast and how the dragon and how the devil acts. Mm -hmm. I would also say if you want to know what the wrath of God looks like, we have place in all of history where it will act it out yeah and that's the cross of calvary amen mm -hmm. if you want to know what the wrath of god like look at what's happening at the cross of calvary what is what is happening to jesus and what part is god the father playing in mm -hmm. what is happening to jesus and with that we've used up all of our time but somebody in the chat has suggested um there really there needs to be a part two of this subject because there's so much more material um and, and i agree with that and it's our bible study so we can do anything we want so uh if you're game angelo i don't know if you're available but um we could do the wrath of god part two uh next wednesday because there's a lot of a lot of additional material that i think that we could look at that would be helpful but we do want to say that what we've discovered tonight in summary is that is that the wrath of God is not contrary to the love of God, 
but is an actual aspect or dimension of God's love, that anger and love are not at odds with one another necessarily, depending on the kind of anger that we're talking about, but and that people who experience evil abuse perpetrated upon them, when they feel angry for what was done to them, their anger is legitimate. And mm -hmm. to feel that anger is a part of their healing and should not be minimized or dismissed or written off as illegitimate. Somebody has wronged you and you shouldn't feel angry. No, somebody has wronged you and you should feel angry. That is the right way to feel. Now let's work through what that looks like in real time relationship with the people um, around us as human beings. So Angela, are you free next Wednesday night? <laughs> Let me look at my schedule. Um, yeah, that'll work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, everybody, you can plan on the wrath of God part two, uh, and, and we'll we'll do that next time. So we'll turn the time back, back over to me now. I think, yeah, that's a good idea to have a part two also because we have a, a decent amount of questions and we're definitely not going to get through them all right now. Um, you guys ready? Yeah. Oof, okay. okay. So this first question comes from Keith and Keith says, if God's wrath is tempered with love, why does it say that his wrath is poured out without mixture? Okay, God's love is not tempered with love. Mm -hmm. God's wrath is love. Mm -hmm. It's not a dose of this and a dose of that. R wrath is a legitimate expression of love. So mm -hmm. I think what Keith is getting at, and he's correct suggesting this, he's, he's pointing us in a direction, and that is that if we have a circle and we title that circle, God is love, the love of God, within the parameters of that circle, justice and mercy are in tension. Or mm -hmm. I don't like the word tension. Let's say justice and mercy are in equilibrium. Mm -hmm. They coexist without conflict, right? If I really love someone, there will be times when justice is the the appropriate manner of relating and there will be times when mercy is the appropriate manner of relating and these aren't in conflict with one another hmm. and when it says more specifically keith that god's wrath is poured out without mixture in the book of revelation i think what that's referring to is that is an allusion to calvary in the gospels where jesus has the cup in his hand and he's drinking the cup of the wrath of God without mixture. I, I think what that's referring to is, is, is justice, full justice, and mercy is no longer something that the human being can comprehend or process or experience. There's never time, and maybe we can get into this next time. I'll let you guys decide um, whether we want, want to bring this up next time. But we should never think of God as like exercising mercy and then saying, you know what? No more of that. Mm -hmm. No more mercy. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be merciful anymore. It's more like this. God is merciful. And human beings push back on mercy to the point that they can't see it, appreciate it, accept it anymore. And all they perceive in God is judgment and justice. They, they can't experience what is actually there in the Father's heart. Yeah. So some of you will understand this language. Um, pro, pro, the door of probation closes from the inside of the human heart not from the inside of God's heart. Mm -hmm. We undergo alterations in our psychology through sin to the point that we can't see God's mercy mm -hmm. and forgiveness and compassion anymore. And so we imagine 
that there is no hope for us. Yeah. So I want to give you an example from my life. When I was a freshman in high school, um, I was not a good student. Uh, my parents sent me to a boarding school and I was uh, immediately on the list called DF and I, which means you have like multiple Ds or Fs or incompletes in terms of your grades. And if you're on the DF and I list, you lose several privileges, including being able to go to the gym during rec time, which is like after dinner. So I wasn't, I didn't really care. I just was, I wanted to go to the gym and hang out with my friends. So I'm outside of the gym door and the girl's dean approaches me and the girl's dean was, her name was Dean Maloney. This was in New Jersey. And she was a, she was a Trinidadian lady. And she saw me hanging out with my friends outside of the gym. And she came, she made a beeline right to me and she got right in my face and just started upbraiding me, like rebuking me. What are you doing with her Trinidadian accent? What's wrong with you? Why are you messing around? You just got their school year started. You're gonna ruin your high school education. You're gonna get kicked out. And like, she just went in on me. I don't really remember the words, but I remember feeling like, oh my goodness, what is this? What is she doing right now? And and just feeling, you know, kind of surprised and shocked and and, and embarrassed a little bit. And then just like mm. as she was about to get to the peak of her diatribe against me, she pulled me in and gave me a huge hug. And she said, you know that I love you. I just want what's best for you. Come to my, come to my apartment and I'm gonna make you some roti this weekend. And it was incredible because I felt nothing but loved by this woman who had just in the front of all my friends, um, <laughs> un, like verbally undressed me. And I was, I had a feeling of fondness and affection for her for the rest of my time in Academy because I knew that she loved me enough mm -hmm. to confront me and she loved me enough to stop me in my tracks and to wake me up to the folly. Yeah, yeah. Of my it took me some time to get there, but it was something that I saw in her that I could not question her love for me and that her actions mm. in rebuking me were actually an extension of her love for me. And so it wasn't like her yeah. wrath was mingled with love, but her wrath was, was part and parcel of her love for me. Shout out Dee Maloney, best road yeah. team. <laughs> okay, uh, next question, let's see here. We are gonna do uh let's do this one okay so this is from actually wait sorry i just changed my mind we're gonna do a different one okay um here we go this is from uh i believe it's simone um and she says for god all sins are the same so what would you do with the victimizer? Should you forgive knowing that God forgives me every day for my transgressions? You guys kind of talked about forgiveness, but maybe you can just speak into her question specifically. Mm. Well, Simone, I would encourage you to uh, please, if you wouldn't mind, uh, take the time to read a recent post on my Facebook page called The Nature of Forgiveness and When to End a Relationship. I know it's a long title. The Nature of Forgiveness and When to End a Relationship. While there is truth to the idea that all sins are the same to God in the sense that all sin, the wages of all sin is death, right? And all sin requires forgiveness there's there's a sense in which that is true from the divine vantage point uh, God deals with us in ways that we are not always and sometimes ever equipped to deal with one right so if you're in a relationship with a friend or a family member or somebody who who raises their voice to you or lies to you um, or steals $20 out of your wallet, 
you're going to move through the process of working out those, those you know, offenses in the relationship through conversations and the nuances of, hey, so let's talk about that, right? But if a family member or a friend sexually molests a person, rapes a person, violently abuses a person, while all sin is the same in the sense that all the wages of all sin is death and all sin requires forgiveness, all sin is not the same in the gravity of the psychological and physical trauma it imposes on the victim. Mm -hmm. You know, if if I steal twenty dollars from you, that is a sin. It's wrong, and I shouldn't have done it. If I punch you repeatedly in the head three days a week for five years of our relationship, that is in a different category, and it is impacting the quality of your existence, your self-respect, your capacity for knowing yourself as a person of dignity. You know, every time physical or sexual, even emotional verbal abuse is heaped on a person, it is chipping away at their self understanding, at their sense of dignity, right? So all sin is the same before God in that all sin, the wages of sin is death and all sin requires forgiveness. But all sin is not the same in the traumatizing effect that it imposed upon the victim. So mm -hmm. Simone, you're asking, well, God forgives all sin, so I should forgive all sin. Yes, you should give all sin and you can forgive someone and at the same time, cut them off from your life because of the nature of their abuse their traumatizing effect. In fact, just to make the point, I'll say this, just to show how these two things go to, you, you can literally forgive someone, call the police on them, have them arrested, press charges and put them in jail while forgiving them. Mm -hmm. Again, forgiveness is not synonymous with trust and forgiveness is not synonymous with fondness or friendship. You can forgive somebody and say, you know what, I forgive you, but I can't have you in my life anymore because of the kinds of things that you have done to me are destroying me. Mm. So I hope that helps, Simone, but I re really want to encourage you to read that article on the nature of forgiveness and when to end a relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we put it in the chat. There's a link for it. Mm. Oh, thank and, you. Do you have anything you wanted to add? Simone, I want you to notice uh, that went by rather fast, that just to make it easy for you to find and everybody else who wants to understand this subject, uh, in the chat, there's a link for the article on the nature of forgiveness and when to end a relationship. Yeah. Um, no, I don't have anything to add, but uh, there's a question here that's really heavy. Um, Which one? Um, there's what, a, what about if I have forgiven my father? <laughs> Can I read it? So it says, what about if I have forgiven my father, hope he will be in heaven, but I personally don't want to see him there. Him in heaven, but far away from me, is this wrong? Well, first of all, those feelings are completely legitimate and, and right feelings. To have the kinds of things that have been done to, you know, I don't know who's asking this question, but Stop I've thinking. experienced things of, uh, who is it? Ingi, I think that's how you pronounce it. Ingi, I've experienced things of a nature that it's almost inconceivable to me. That the, that the person who did that, I won't go into the details to me, it's almost inconceivable to me that since I have not known them, years have gone by, 
I don't know where they are. I don't know if they're alive or dead, but I'm telling you, it would be pretty crazy to, to step into the presence of Jesus and to see, because I don't know, that person, for all I know, could have undergone some kind of spiritual revolution. Jesus could be a part of their life right now, and we end up being in the eternal kingdom together. I mean, let me, let me get, a, there are some biblical examples of this. Think about, think about Paul presiding over the stoning of Stephen. The last thing Stephen knows is that this guy named Saul, full of anger and rage and hate, murdered him or presided over his murder as an accomplice. That's the last thing Stephen knows. Stephen wakes up on resurrection morning and sees Jesus. Isn't that Saul? And he sees the guy who murdered him there, right? And Jesus, you know, you can imagine Stephen might say, Jesus, is that is that Saul? Is that the one who, who, and Jesus, well, actually, his name is Paul now. And there's a story here. Let me, let me explain what happened after he murdered you. Yeah. Let me, um, because I got me... into his heart. I introduced myself to him and he deeply, profoundly repented for what he did to you, Stephen. Can I, you may not be ready right now, but but when you're ready, I'd like to I'd like to sit down and mediate a conversation between you and you, Stephen, and and, and Paul. W would you be open to that? And I can imagine Stephen might say, I, "I'm just not ready for that, Jesus." Yeah. No, I'm not ready. But yeah, I will. When give me some time. I need to yeah. do this. Yeah. Maybe two days, two years, two millennia. I don't know. <laughs> Finally, you know, I don't know how it's going to be. Can you imagine all the people, all the Israelites that were murdered and abused by Nebuchadnezzar coming mm -hmm. up on resurrection morning and seeing Nebuchadnezzar in heaven? Mm -hmm. Like, what is Nebuchadnezzar doing here? That's the guy that enslaved our people and destroyed us. And he's here? Jesus, can you explain? Mm -hmm. So the way you feel is completely legitimate. Mm -hmm. And if your father is in the eternal kingdom, Inga, you can be absolutely assured, although it's not easy, that Jesus got into his heart and some radical, radical alteration, repentance and change took place. He's not the same person who abused you. Yeah. He's so, not that person. Yeah. Now, I'm sorry to, I don't want to, I don't want to be insensitive, but he's not the same person anymore. And yet he is the same yeah. so, person. And so. Yeah. Um, this past Sabbath, um, I ran into a church member who I hadn't seen in, in several months. And this person, this church member's spouse had been having an affair and subsequently left her. And the last time I'd spoke to her, she was full of anger and resentment and pain, obviously. And I hadn't seen her for many months. And when I saw her, I was so happy to see her. We had a conversation and she said, you know, I was so full of anger and wrath and I had no idea how I was going to get through that experience. And she said, I went to a therapist and, um, and I had to mourn the death of my husband because when he left me, he was no longer my husband. When we got divorced, my husband no longer existed. And she said, I had to go through a mm. process of mourning his death and mourning his loss and going through all of that trauma to walk through that trauma and feel it and experience it. And it was only until I mourned the loss of my husband that I could now see this man as just the father of my daughter. The boundaries exist, but I can look at this, as, at this person as someone who mm. I want the best for because my husband is dead. Now there's just this man there who is the, the father of my daughter who I have to work with to raise my child well. And when I read mm. this, it brought me to this 
this con this notion when you said Saul and Paul that if if NG your if your if your father ever makes it to heaven he won't be that father that you've experienced he won't be that person anymore that person will have died mm. that person will have been crucified that person will have experienced the wrath of God exactly but if he does make it to heaven mm -hmm. he'll be a different person maybe you mm -hmm. won't relate to him as your father anymore but he will be a soul that's been redeemed and this is how when when you know when stephen sees saul he's like how did saul make it here and jesus is going to have to explain well actually he's paul saul died on that road and yeah. this is a new this is a new person when you're ready i can introduce you to him and I think yeah. maybe the same thing we'll experience when we say, how did this person make it here? Yeah. Well, yeah. that's not the person you experienced. That person has a new name. Yeah. When you're ready, yeah. I can introduce you to him. Yeah, in the chat, Joseph reminds us of Revelation 21 and God will, shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That's not just the physical act of, you know, wiping liquid that is emerging from eyeballs you know it's not just the physical act that's a metaphor for god will heal our emotional hurts amen he will comfort us through our emotional god will wipe away all tears means god will heal our emotional hurts and he will walk us through to the other side of that pain with his comfort yeah and that healing is so amazing that it's <laughs> it's crazy right because i want to be healed right now and this concept that like <laughs> he has time for our healing and mm. i'm in such a hurry to get healed but maybe what church is about it's about taking this journey together where we come together and we say hey we're not all there yet we're still we're yeah. still hurt we're still we still have feelings and as long as we're in this mortal body there's going to be triggers and those triggers are going to lead us to have bad moments and bad days and bad weeks and bad years but that doesn't mean we still don't belong to the father mm -hmm. it means that we're all mm -hmm. healing together now yeah and throughout mm -hmm. the millennium it's going to take it's going to take time and that's okay because god has time for your healing and he has time for yeah. my healing. Yeah, yeah. Praise God. Man, that's beautiful. Um, yeah, there's some other questions that I think are really important and relevant, but we're kind of past our time. So yeah, if we're doing a part two. We should definitely, I can bring these questions over. Um, yeah. Ty, Angelo, thanks so much. I think that was really, I was taking some notes because I think what you guys shared was really powerful. And just from reading the chat, mm -hmm. I think it really has been a blessing to everybody. So thank you guys for joining us again. And yeah, thank you that we can do this again next week. Mm -hmm. All right. See you guys so next week. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for being here and invite people. I mean, this is a weekly event that we can really come together and understand some things. So thanks for joining us. God bless. All right. See you guys. Thanks so much for joining us. All right, everybody. Um, and just a reminder that this has been recorded and they're recorded every week. And so you can find all the previous um, studies at lightbearers.org slash live. And then just scroll down and you'll find all the previous um, parts. You can also register for next week's study. We're going to do a part two, like I said, of God's wrath and how to understand it with Angelo. And you can register. There should be a button popping up at the bottom of your screen for that in just a second. Um, yeah. And just a reminder, please um, invite your friends to join us. Um, I know I was very, yeah, it was moving to read the chat and see how many people. This is such a relevant topic and healing and meaningful. So if you know someone who has struggled to understand how God can be love and and a god of wrath or what does it look like um please share this with them and invite them to join us um all right everybody we will see you all next week take care